Hello, I'm Rajneesh. And I'm Bridget. Welcome to Terra Science, the podcast where reality matters. I'm a plant scientist, and early on in my career, I decided that I could be more useful to the planet uh, by focusing my attention to agriculture, food, nutrition, and planetary health. And I'm also interested in consciousness. And recently, uh, Bridget and I started this uh, podcast, Terra Science, to invite wonderful guests and discuss problems, but also solutions that can help us find answers in the near future. Yes, absolutely. And I'm a communication grad and a former vertical farmer that um, is very interested in public education and nutrition as well. And today we have a very, very special guest, Canopy Meg, uh, Meg Lohman. Uh, I met Meg in 2015 for the first time. Um, I gave a TED talk soon after hers. And uh, I have to say, there were big shoes to fill <laughs> soon after that wonderful talk on climbing canopies. Uh, but I have uh, tried and stayed in touch with Meg all of these years uh, and followed her work and recently um, also uh, read her book that recently came out, The Arbor Knot. So it's wonderful to have you here. Right? Oh, thank you. What a pleasure. And I'm just so happy to be able to rejoin our discussions, Rajneesh, of years past and meet you, Bridget. So this is really great. Thank you. So uh, just to get us started, uh, Meg is, is an ecologist. And I will say her motto is that no child le left indoors. <laughs> <laughs> and especially uh, she's a huge... A proponent of um, bringing uh, women and minorities and also uh, people with disabilities into uh, science and exploration. And I would I will uh, ask Meg uh, if you can introduce yourself uh, uh, to tell us uh, how what what got you interested in canopies and and uh, your uh, brief you know uh, life story, and then we'll discuss uh, more in depth. Oh, thanks. Sure thing. Oh, so I'm a small town kid, nothing fancy, no big advantage in any way, except I did climb a few trees as a child and made a few very dangerous tree forts with my little girlfriends. And somehow I was able to take that childhood love of nature and trees and turn it into a career, which is pretty crazy, and ended up being one of the first people in the world to find techniques to study the whole tree, whereas most foresters study just the bottom of the tree, or if they ever saw the top of a tree, it was after they cut it down, and they usually, of course, squished the insects and the birds had all flown away, and suddenly I developed a couple of methods to go up a tree, and it turned our world around because so many things live up there, and as it turns out, so many important things are happening. So the technical term for my profession is arbornaut, whereas astronauts explore outer space and aquanauts explore undersea, Arbornauts technically explore the tops of trees. So that's a little summary of my whole life in two minutes or Thanks. less. That's great. Uh, I will say I've also <laughs> met some psychonauts. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it's, 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 it's wonderful. Arbornauts is a really good term. Uh, and I just wanted to show uh, this book. Uh, this, I think, came out in 2021. And um, I thought we can have uh, our discussion today and maybe uh, have it in three parts. In the first part, we can talk about uh, the problems that we face as a planet, as, uh, as a single species that uh, sort of uh, uh, does a lot of work on the planet and impacts it uh, and the problems that we face. Then the second part, uh, all the work that you have done and the challenges that you faced. And in the third part, maybe talk about some of the solutions. So in the first part, to, to just uh, start discussing the problems, I, I really enjoyed reading your book and the way you describe, uh, first of all, the, uh, the diversity on the planet and how much of that is above the canopy. It is amazing. You know, because of a couple of us climbing these trees, we now recognize that 50% of the terrestrial biodiversity lives in the treetops, which is pretty surprising. Yeah. I call it hit you over the head science because 
you know, I'm not really an Einstein or some kind of fancy person that developed all these new formula, but it's just by climbing these trees, we suddenly realized a whole continent exists over our heads. And that's pretty awesome. And of course, in light of global issues, as you might have alluded to initially, Rajneesh, you know, half the world's primary forests have disappeared in our lifetimes. The three of us, maybe at least two of us are the same age. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just really, really disappointing. And what's frustrating to me as an academic is we've published hundreds of papers and spent lots of research dollars, but it doesn't at all correlate to saving the forests. It might give us data sets that people can manipulate, but I'm worried that in the scientific community, you know, we've kind of not focused on the solutions as much as we should have early and on. And also, as you mentioned in your book, um, having old growth forests is so important because of maintaining the diversity and the habitats of all the uh, uh, people or, or organisms that live there, and especially some of the remote forests where a lot of science has not actually occurred, where you went in uh, with uh, citizen science and all these programs that right. you created. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. A lot of people have taken, I think, some kind of hope in planting trees, which is really great. There's nothing wrong with planting more trees, but it certainly doesn't substitute for saving the old growth mm -hmm. forests. I always point out to kids, a koala can't live on a seedling. It needs a big tree to survive. And so does a sloth. And so do those millions and millions of other species that have their community in the canopy. So we as humans have really, I think, taken advantage of the tree planting solution to think that one seedling equals one senior citizen. It would be saying, you know, we get rid of all of the elders in the community with all the knowledge and all of the experiences and say we can substitute them for babies. And we just can't be that way. And it's been an uphill battle, I think, in conservation because it's not so easy to protect trees. They don't have a voice. They don't have as much charisma as a chimpanzee or a dolphin. And so we're struggling, I think, in this world to help people get educated about the value of a tree, which is millions of dollars, literally, in all of the things they do yeah. for us. Absolutely. And Go ahead. Uh, I, I don't know if you had a question. But <laughs> That's okay. Uh, so uh, uh, I was thinking maybe you can tell us about the f uh, several different ways that some of them actually most of them that you designed to study uh, canopies and some others, including, um, I think, uh, it's sort of like a, a, a balloons and things. Uh, so maybe we can talk about some of the ways that, including the ones you designed, how to study those top canopies. Sure. So when I was a really young and naive graduate student on a scholarship to Sydney University in Australia, I suddenly found myself confronting 200 foot high trees. And where I grew up in northern New York State, the trees were only 50 feet high. So I couldn't see the leaves. I couldn't see what was up there. And yet I had this crazy idea that I wanted to learn about leaves in tropical trees. And so I did take a piece of metal and weld it in the university shop into a slingshot, which was an actual gadget that wasn't for sale in Australia at the time. And I took a string and learn how to put the string over a branch and then in turn pull a rope over the branch. And I sewed a harness from some seatbelt webbing and I borrowed some caving equipment from folks who use their gadgets to go down into a cave. I wanted to go up, but the gadgets all apply differently. And they thought I was pretty funny, those cavers. Um, and lo and behold, scared out of my wits, I'll be honest, I managed to climb my first tree, a coachwood, and when I got up to the top, everything was buzzing and pollinating and eating each other and doing all the cool things that happen in a very healthy ecosystem. So there was sort of no looking back or down or whatever you want to say. And, you know, after doing that rope business for, gosh, four or five years and teaching a lot of others to do the same, I still felt frustrated that you could only have one person on one rope for safety reasons. So I did end up working at an ecotourist lodge in Queensland, Australia, where thanks to a wonderful bottle of red wine in fine Australian fashion, the director of the lodge and I had this 
idea that we sketched on the back of a napkin, you know, what if we could make a trail in the treetops? What if we could create these skywalks or bridges? And lo and behold, the first one was born in Australia in 1985. And that in turn, I really do truly believe led a lot of Australians to rethink saving their rainforests. They had thought of them as dark, evil places full of snakes and mud and leeches. But when they got into this walkway, they were just so odd and got a sense of wonder. And so I came back to North America and built some there and built some in Central America. And the idea has caught on all around the world. So that led to technique number two, because with the canopy walkway, you can take a dozen people at once or a whole class. And then along the way, I met some creative, brilliant French people who had these inflatable ideas. And we ended up mounting several expeditions using hot air balloons and inflatable rafts. And then finally, the Smithsonian piloted the use of a construction crane in 1992, which is the fourth major method, but a little expensive for most countries to afford because the crane drivers are unionized and you have to bring one into the jungle. And you can imagine that's a pretty expensive endeavor. And they drive the crane, but the scientists operates the data collecting. So there are only about 10 cranes in the world. There's only one set of inflatables, but there are now about 50 walkways and hopefully several hundred sets of ropes comprising the canopy toolkit. That's, wow, that's, that's absolutely incredible. And I just want to mention, like, as you're talking, I, I've also read most of your book as well. <laughs> and I know you're summarizing it right now, but I can hear you, you referencing things that you talked about and it is in fantastic detail in here as well too as as you're reading it I feel like I'm I'm also looking up into the canopies sometimes because of how well you describe it so I just wanted to mention that oh, as well. okay. you know and I praise my editor because I think she kept saying why did you make a slingshot what co caused you to do what you did and <laughs> I had to really like sit alone for hours and hours and remember right. what in the heck made me do these crazy things. And so I guess that's the value of a book where you can kind of mm -hmm. spew out the whole process of science, in this case, yeah. field biology, which, you know, people think of some kind of rugged crocodile Dundee and maybe it is a little bit, but you know, it's full of curiosity and methods and it's lots an of adventure fun. story. And like, I feel like, also, just about you in particular, I feel like you're very relentless almost and a really, it's a good thing um, to be able to go back out and consistently go through all the data and, you know, leeches and insects and all of that too, that I think most people or some people at least will not, will not put themselves through. Yeah. I, I know I was crazy. <laughs> but, yeah. Sorry. I might've gotten us off topic. No, there. no, no. That That's actually. No, thanks for your pitch for the book. I'm so grateful because I wrote it for people like you to get a sense yeah. of field biology for hopefully for women yeah. to appreciate the challenges and for people to think hard about the fact that there still are these discoveries in our yeah. own backyards. <laughs> I mean, what could be more local than a tree? Most people have seen one tree in his or her life and guess what? There probably is a new species up that one tree you've ever seen in your life and Yet nobody ever bothered right. to look and for And I was that. just going to say, like, the, I just moved and there's this insanely massive oak tree in the front lawn that I was standing at it this morning. And I was like, I, I should climb this. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to make yes, an expedition, yes. Bridget. Some, I need some ropes or a canopy here. <laughs> It'd be great to discover a new species on your new oak tree. Uh <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. Well, and, and yeah. uh, you know, and I, I agree with you, Bridget. I think I also felt when I was reading uh, the book, uh, I felt like I was climbing the trees with uh, Matt, mm -hmm. the way it was described. And uh, uh, also not just experiencing, because from a science perspective, I've always been a lab scientist, uh, you know, and, and I really appreciated how you described, Meg, about uh, the complexities of doing science out in the field. And many of those uh, data sets and designs you had to develop yourself, especially maybe uh, uh, if we can talk a little bit about the uh, defoliation or, or uh, insects. I think you've contributed mm -hmm. immensely to that topic. And I have a specific question, which 
uh, which I will uh, ask uh, maybe uh, right now, and we we can address both. You know uh, how you started looking at defoliation. I think in your book, I didn't expect it as I was reading. As you first climbed up, uh, it almost uh, felt like it was a surprise to you as well that there were holes in the leaves. <laughs> <laughs> It was a surprise. As a botanist, I guess I thought all the leaves would be perfect and they would be highly defended from any enemies. And so therefore there would never be holes. And that was one of the amazing, I call it a dog leg in my research. And I think research is full of these little zigs and zags where you don't expect something to come out the way it did. And so when I did very carefully number all these leaves because I was interested in their lifespan, and then I returned a month later and found half of the numbers had little bites out of them and half of the leaves had big bites out of them. I thought, oh my gosh, these insects really, really upset me at the time. I thought they were absolutely disgusting to do this to my beautiful field methods. Um, but then I thought, wait a minute, maybe this is a huge impact on the tree. And of course it turned out to be that way. And studying these, what we call plant insect interactions became so much more important. And lo and behold, some of these insects, you know, were truly kind of determining the fate of the whole forest. And so that's obviously one of the more modern stories as we link things to climate change. Back in the eighties, we didn't understand that dry conditions which led to more insects, which stressed the trees was really a climate change episode. We just thought, oh, it's a once in a hundred year event and we don't have to worry about it. But now, you know, we know so differently. And I think we were all pretty naive yes. at the time. And uh, so my question uh, related to that, uh, as also from agricultural perspectives, you know, of course, insects can kill trees and plants. And maybe that happens more under stress conditions, like you mentioned. But what I find very amazing, and also your findings uh, describe that, uh, is uh, maximum maybe there's 25% or 30% loss of leaf cover. And and uh, in agriculture, maybe it's a little bit more. And also in some trees, I think it was, it was sassafras, uh, where uh, it was a lot more. Um, but what seems to be amazing to me, and maybe I'm over uh, analyzing this, there seems to be an understanding between the tree and the and the specific insect how much to consume, how much to devour. I think so too. Right. I absolutely agree with you. And I don't know if I put all of that in my book. I, there were so many things that I wanted to put in. And I was amazed the editor let me put in so many little technical studies. But I did a publication about what I felt like was appropriate consumption and inappropriate where some insects actually waste foliage because they eat little big zigzags and cause the rest of the leaf to brown and die, which is very inefficient feeding. And others just eat little bits and pieces, which is very efficient because the rest of the leaf remains productive. And there is obviously an impact where an insect in some evolutionary sense realizes if I eat the whole gosh darn tree, my you know, children and grandchildren are ruined. Uh, you know, it's just fascinating to think about those evolutionary constraints. And the fact is when insects do eat foliage, it does cause the tree to create chemical defenses. It does make the tree stronger and greater the same way that when uh, we cut the grass, it keeps the grass healthy. I mean, it's just a crazy thing that a little bit of grazing is actually not a bad and, thing. And may have provided the evolutionary uh, incentive uh, to select for mm -hmm. for that behavior. Yeah. Yeah. And with crops, it's very challenging to you, I'm sure, because you have these monocultures and that must make it yes, a lot more and, challenging. And, you know, the reason a lot of those monocultures exist is to uh, to provide solutions to certain insect and uh, with insecticides inherent in crops. And but we won't go <laughs> there for now. Uh, yeah. But you know what? I'd love to just mention that we found so many single species or monodominant tropical forests. And one of my advisors, Joe Connell, a fairly famous rainforest and diverse, biodiversity ecologist because he studied coral reefs. And he and I went or, you know, around the world and looked at all of these single species forests. And quite frankly, there are more than you would realize. And there are these controls of insects on them. And we did, you know, look into the soil and discover the mycorrhizal association. So there's all these amazing factors that are controlling 
if species have one species dominant canopy or multi species dominant canopies and how and, they survive. And you mentioned that in your book, the mother tree, that it, it may not be just the same species. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. also, uh, uh, through all these expeditions, uh, you uh, and your teams discovered many new species, uh, including nutmeg, uh, which which yeah. <laughs> <laughs> new beetle, all and the time, also yeah. tardigras, uh, eight and, species of tardigras. <laughs> oh, wow. I know. My poor boys, They, my son, Eddie, got his wedding present was a species of tardigrade named after him and his wife. He's like, Mom, you know, most kids get a car or a deposit for a house. We got a new species of water bear from Ethiopia. <laughs> but anyway, I hope they love it. They know it's out That's there amazing. somewhere. <laughs> And um, one thing I was I wanted to to talk about also is just how you not only have all of these challenges with the research to do with the environment, but also um, the people that you meet. I think some of them seem to be amazing throughout the book, but also you've also had a lot of struggles because of um, different inequalities and such through through um, you know gender inequality as well. Um, if there's anything you'd, on that you'd like to discuss as well. Well, I'd love to. And in a sense, that's really what inspired me to write a memoir. I didn't, I'm not a famous enough scientist like Marie Curie to write my memoir, but I really wanted to put my ideas to paper about maybe helping other young women be better than I was and maybe avoid all of my misadventures, as I call them. And so that was part of the inspiration to write the book. But when I was little, I never had a woman science teacher. I never knew a woman scientist. I loved Rachel Carson, but she was dead. I loved Harriet Tubman, who was, in my eyes, a naturalist because she felt the moss on the trees in the middle of the night leading the slaves northward on the Underground Railway. So I had these figures I really admired, but they weren't living people. And so it was just amazing to me to keep loving trees and studying trees and become a scientist, but then look around. And of course, I was asked to make the coffee or I was, you know, um, ejected from the geology class and this and that and the other. So I had to really pretty quietly, because I was shy, you know, sort of persist and pursue. And I think things are changing, but I still believe that women don't have it quite the same as men. So it's important. It took me my whole career to dare to speak out about that because I guess I was afraid of losing my job if I ever, you know, was negative about the gender inequality in some of my workplaces. But I think it's long ago and far away, you know, more than time for all of us women to speak out and just help both genders. I'm the mother of two boys. So I really want boys to benefit too from recognizing implicit bias and other things that happen along the way. And hopefully the book points that out. I tried to make it mostly amusing because some of the issues were pretty funny, um, but maybe not inside, but I had to make light of them in order to survive. And I think, you know, today we are hopefully on the path forward to more inclusivity and particularly with minorities, which meant a lot to me to work with as advisees because I felt a lot of sympathy and empathy with some of my students that also had to have a fairly difficult pathway, as did I. And I think that kind of um, might be relating to how you were calling it, like the tall poppy effect. Um, I really, uh, you, you mentioned it multiple times and it felt like it kept happening to you where there'd be some sort of like toxic leadership that, you know, you'd, you'd be demoted or some sort of, um, just not recognized for, for all of your efforts and accomplishments. And then, you know, seeing other people have to go through the same thing that, that is difficult. It makes me feel very lucky for, you know, being, having so many opportunities in in my generation as well, but also recognizing that you are part of the generation that led the path, especially in the science field. And um, even if you felt like you had to stay silent, I'm so glad you didn't give up (laughs) and kept pushing through, Uh, you know, making sure that, 
you know, even if your book's coming out now, people like me who I did communication, I'm not a science major at all, but I'm reading it and I'm way more, you know, open eyed to things about the science world that I had before, you know, so I think that's still making a great impact. Yeah. 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 Oh, gosh. Well, there are plenty of stories I didn't put in the book. I can Maybe there'll be a, a round two. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I, I wanted to add to that, uh, Bridget, uh, what Bridget is talking about. I think uh, there's cultures, and certainly I come from mm-hmm. one as well, where uh, it's integrated into uh, early on in, um, you know, uh, in childhood, uh, different roles, right. gender roles, and, and that just uh, uh, causes problems in putting ceilings, mental uh, ceilings in what one can achieve. Um, but as also as as a uh, sort of like a, not maybe a minority because, you know, Indians, uh, there's probably more Indians <laughs> on, around the planet. We're certainly not a minority, but we are a minority in terms of certain professions. And, uh, and so I, I also experienced some sort of similar pressures, but not the same way as gender uh, inequalities. But I, I was just thinking when I was reading uh, and relating to many of the things, but also appreciating the different types of things that men don't experience, but women do. So I I think it's a really important aspect uh, of this book um, for people to read, uh, both men and women, to to understand and maybe, you know, cause some better changes in our societies. Right. And I hope so. And also culturally, I'm glad you brought that up, Rajneesh, because I have a huge love for India, for example. I did a Fulbright there. I've been there dozens of times and have family almost with my colleagues. And yet writing about another person's culture is a tricky thing. You know, I tried so hard to make sure that it sounded objective and kind. And even though you and I both know there are times when my women colleagues were very much under the gun. And yet I couldn't just write a book with their voice, but, you know, I had to try very hard to try to explain for the, the take home message for me always was you need to develop trust in these different cultures, Ethiopia, India, Malaysia, some of the different case studies that I used in my chapters, but it still is difficult. And I still, I hate to say it, observe some of my Western colleagues go to countries and act like colonialists, you know, where they dominate, they want their data set and then go home. They don't want to pray with the local priests or they don't want to maybe stop and, you know, be mindful of whatever the local protocols might be. And so we live in a world where there's just this quiet tension in science that still needs ironing out. Which I I appreciated very much, especially you highlight that further in the church forests of Ethiopia. We're going there and uh, uh, really relating with the culture and individuals um, and having uh, someone on the ground there um, uh, to to cause such a positive change, which even today continues. Right. Yeah, it is tricky. And I look at our academic system and I worry because I don't think they teach us, oh, by all means, develop trust with your colleagues or take time out to pray if that's what the locals require you to do. You know, there's still a little bit too much zealous attention on the publication end and the promotion comes from the data set, but not from perhaps saving the forest. And I don't know how we can make that change occur in our academic leadership. It needs a really strong provost or college president, I think, to come to the fore and say, you know what, I'm going to base tenure on something different from the number of journal articles that you've published. It just still kind of worries me because, you know, deforestation is huge and climate change is huge. And these are all the things scientists care about, but I'm not sure that we're really creating the solutions we wished we were. Yeah, I think our systems have uh, uh, fostered competition more than collaboration. And and until until we can Mm. uh, change that environment of more to be more collaborative, um, and hopefully uh, we are on that track. And you've certainly started that with all these symposiums, including the fifth one that was in India. And uh, actually, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, we, you introduced me to Subhadra, I think, three or four uh, years ago. And I did a Zoom call yeah. with her. And I think we, um, we, we applied for, uh, applied for a, um, I think it was a, 
a grant together uh, of course you know that it was first application it didn't work out but i thought we had a really good plan and i would love to go back and try to uh, work together with you and subhadra to bring to you know try some of those ideas including class light which was which is developed by greg asner uh, which is right based right fantastic yeah. Yeah, that would be so great, and I think it's time for India to be part of that. It would be fabulous. So we can we can talk more about that uh, uh, later on, but continuing, um, you know, I, I wanted to also bring up uh, some of the technologies that you mentioned in your book, including iNaturalist and uh, BioBuzz. I think it's called. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about those two. Sure, you know, and I was the director of science at the Cal Academy at a critical time, so I was fortunate to broker the deal to bring iNaturalist, these two crazy guys that had developed an app. And it's Stanford, mind you, in Greg Asner's lab, by the way. And we're looking for a home. So we figured out how to keep them in the museum because they belong in the museum world. And it was very touch and go for quite a few years. Nobody wanted to pay them a salary <coughs> except me and one or two others. But now it's quite a foundation, I think, of citizen science, as we call it. We're People can take pictures of wildlife, <coughs> submit it, or do little bio blitzes, meaning little, you know, field days where you count everything in a city park and you submit it. And experts love to go online and give the IDs, and it's all become part of an amazing data set. So we're building up this toolkit for average people to do science, which is really, really critical and hopefully not only inspires kids, but produces pretty good data for governments and local, you know, places to understand what lives in their neighborhood. Yeah, I think combining that with, with uh, some of the uh, technology Bridget and I are working on, uh, which I started, actually, that's the TED Talk I gave on in 2015. Uh, it's, it's an app, but uh, it's uh, evolved, uh, and I've been working on it pretty much on my own, uh, developing it uh, over these years. It's simply a platform um, which has the entire food chain on it. So uh, from farmers being able to um, look at more uh, sustainable amendments for soil, accessing microbiome uh, type of uh, research or accessing uh, tools to study what's happening to their soil, what's happening to their crop. Uh, I joke about this, but it's kind of serious. We only worry about soil health many times, but just to worry about soil health is not enough because crop health is even more important. If crop health is good, soil health has to be. It's almost like the refrigerator, which is the soil, which has all the nutrients. But if the crops don't have access to it, then it's all going to waste and going into our rivers and causing all problems. So yeah. we have all these tools yeah. in agriculture that can measure soil health, but we really haven't put much effort into measuring crop health. So I think... Providing that kind of information on this um, platform and connecting farmers directly with consumers as well as grocery stores and restaurants and restaurants and grocery stores being able to show the story of the farmers. Ultimately, I think what I'm leading to is exactly what you said in the last chapter of your book, which is the, the, the only way to cause change is through consumers, how they spend the dollars right. and to educate them and inform them. This platform is designed to do that. I hope you, we need your app right away. We need your app in forestry. We need it everywhere. But it is a frustration because I think most consumers don't purposefully buy things so that their children will have a bad life. I think they buy things for reasons that they are not educated. And we have done a terrible job as a society and <clears throat> I think as an American government to not label products, to not show the supply chain to not even show the origin of a product and really what the energy cost is. And I don't know who can ever make that happen. We need some incredibly charismatic president that can swoop down and just do this. Um, so it's going to be an interesting next couple of years because it's becoming critical now, I think, to <clears throat> make sure that we turn around palm oil and we turn around some of the deforestation in Brazil. And yet, as long as there's a market for the goods, those poor people that own that land or that are farming the beef or growing the oil palms are still going to continue to do that to make a living to feed their own children. So we're really in a very 
awkward place right now for poor old planners. And but you have already made a huge, uh, um, you know, uh, differences in certain certain areas with ecotourism, with the walkways, like Amazon. Right. I'm so optimistic. Yeah. And I'm like ready to, t- I'm going to National Geographic next week to talk about that and praying they'll endorse it like they do Sylvia Earle's ocean oh, wow. project. Um, but I just feel, you know, so excited about finally combining ecology with economics. Cause I think again, in science, we too often overlook the fact that local people need an income <clears throat> and they need to feed their children and so using these canopy walkways, using basically my toolkit from 45 years of research, if we can fundraise just a little bit, it's not a lot in the scheme of things to gift these walkways to developing countries that can't afford to build them and train the women. We have easy programs to help people learn what is it that you need to tell tourists? How can you engage an ecotourist lodge? You know, what kind of ways do you encourage people to come and bird watch, et cetera, et cetera. Then we could really, what I consider, could create genetic libraries. I'm more worried in places like Madagascar and Ethiopia, we're about to lose species that will never be replaced. And in America, we might say, well, we don't care about lemurs, but hey, guess what? The world needs to be global. And I think kids are more global than adults when it comes to caring about species in other kids' backyards. So I'm just hopeful that we can use this as, again, a template for doing things that might create the ecology and the economy and side this by is, side. this project is called Mission Green. Right. And I we have a website now, mission slash green.org. It's all blanketed under my tree foundation, meaning all the donations are tax deductible. We're halfway to fundraising for a walkway in Madagascar. I was just there with the engineers designing the site and oh, all the locals were so excited. They're just like praying because it will bring them jobs and some level of, you know, sustainability. And so, but, you know, raising what $500,000 shouldn't be that difficult, but in America, people pay that for a car, but they maybe don't think they should pay it to help save the forests of Madagascar. So I seek your help to any kinds of ways and means that we can reach people. It's such a great legacy, but I'm not sure that most folks understand, you know, does it mean something if you have, you know, the Rajneesh walkway in Madagascar with a great big plaque in the front, or what will we need to do to get people excited about being part of such a future opportunity? So I am still, you know, excited and need your help in making this Mm -hmm. come true because it's not about any of us. Our names won't be on it, but um, it's about really saving these species and making having enough genetic diversity in some of these ecosystems to sustain it for the yeah. future. And to anybody who's who's listening to this podcast, we're going to link to the Tree Foundation in our description as well. And please share this podcast to to you know get the word out more about Meg's, Meg's missions here too. Absolutely, absolutely. Postpone your Ferrari for a year and help us save the lemurs. Or, you know, maybe you don't need that extension on your house or that sub-zero refrigerator this year. (laughs) But, you know, it is getting pretty desperate. When I was young, I thought, oh, we've got to hurry up and save the forest. But now that we have the real data about deforestation and species, you know, 70% of insects gone in Europe and crazy, terrible, you know, disappearances of birds and other important wildlife. We know that we need to act quickly. And the good news is canopy walkways provide this amazing opportunity. They provide fabulous vacations and they provide great jobs and they save species without logging. And so I feel like it's all plus, 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 but we just still have to fund them and then turn them over to the local people. We have a great model in Malaysia, and I'm so grateful. One philanthropist, a businessman, funded the whole thing. I didn't have to spend three years running ragged trying to get little checks from people, but he just said, I need to do this. This is my community, and I will do this. And they have a fabulous walkway on Penang Hill, and people go there, and locals work at it, and school kids go there, and I just feel really happy about that. One just opened in Eureka, by the way. 
all I did there was the fundraiser for Gretchen Ziegler, the director of the Sequoia Zoo in days past. And now it's come to fruition and kids again can go and walk through a redwood canopy and it's fantastic. And again, that's just an iconic forest system that is endangered and yet it's in a wealthy country. So we were never planning to fundraise to help California build a walkway. But the good news is the local people of California decided they would do it. And so we have this, you know, growing necklace of these walkways in very special forests, which is great. Yeah, And uh, I think the one you mentioned is called Lemur Way, uh, right? And and then yes. uh, also I wanted to mention another one. I think it was in Amazon where there was a school being built and it was struggling. And uh, with the walkway, they were able to pay for the school. Uh, right. That was in Western Samoa, actually. Yeah. Actually. With, with Paul Cox anyway, but close enough. We have one in the Amazon too, but that was fantastic because it provided the incentive for the people to say, wow, we could sell the logs to pay for the school, or we could build a walkway and take a chance on ecotourism to pay for the school. And they took the chance and the chance bore fruit. So they now have paid for the school in two years, wow. they paid for the school, which was so right. great. No, that, that's yeah. great. And you know, of course here uh, where we, where I am, uh, Bridget used to be in California, we have the Redwoods. And I think you mentioned right. a little bit how difficult it is to uh, look at the counties of the Redwoods. And I, I don't know if the walkways are possible or if any, exists, including like sequoias, but uh, how do we get up there? Yeah. <laughs> right. And that, what I just mentioned, I was probably in my haste, I didn't clarify, but at the Sequoia Zoo, that walkway is through okay. some redwoods, but young redwoods, oh. only a hundred years old, which are fairly young, meaning the walkway is about 75 feet high, but it's still fabulous because for now, still going into a young grove of redwoods i think is inspiring for everybody so you have to get up to eureka that'll be your homework oh, I, I, I would love to have a seven-year-old and i can't wait to bring him to uh, that and, um, but but it's it's great great and, i've driven through them i've seen i've seen them from their big toes the big i've only ones. seen their big toes yeah <laughs> For you, that's great. Yeah, I don't know if we'll ever get a walkway in the thousand-year-old redwoods, but for now, this is good enough. Well, I, uh, before we we stop, I know Bridget, you mentioned that you had a question about fig trees. I don't want. Oh to yeah, I just really loved the part where you're talking about the fig trees and how they grew from top down. Um, uh, so I was just wondering if you could elaborate on how how they they exist. A, a kind of a strangler, sure. too, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah. So in every chapter in the book, I had a favorite mm -hmm. tree and I did a little tree essay at the end, which was my editor's idea. I worried it was too technical, but I guess people can always skip it if they don't want to read about trees. But my chapter about the challenges of women in science, I identified with the fig tree. That was my icon, my yeah. mentor, my inspiration. And the reason I did is because figs are the only group of trees that start life at the top. So they take total strategic advantage of water and sunlight right away. Whereas seedlings on the forest floor, which I studied for many, many years, are always at the risk of drought or shade or being trampled or something. So here are these brilliant figs. You think, why didn't all these other families of trees do that? Who knows? But Anyway, I use the fig in a lot of my lectures to women saying, you know, we need to be smart. We need to be strategic. And so I brought that up and wrote an essay about the figs being my exemplary tree that I try to imitate. I Not necessarily to strangle my male counterparts, but simply to be always using my energy wisely. And the one thing I love about figs, and you will too, Rajneesh, they're the center of every village in India. They're the sacred trees in Asia. They're in South America, they're here in Florida, they provide their fruits, they provide their shelter, their shade, they're an extraordinary, you know, kind of community center. They're the ban and so I banyan trees, right? Exactly. The banyan trees, there are some 700 kinds of figs of which some are banyans and some are this and that, but it's just, I think, a fabulous group of trees. And so they're my favorite, favorite. Thank you. Yeah, I, I found them to be really interesting, and and also just how you you made that connection. Yeah, great. I'm so happy. Go hug a fig next I will. time you're somewhere a little. 
Oh, well, Texas has yes, probably. Oh, I'll keep my eyes out. <laughs> Right, and, and it's also connected to spiritual seeking. Uh, 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 I think uh, Buddha received his en- enlightenment under the boat tree. Exactly. Also mentioned in your the book. Boat. So important. Right. Well, the, this has been great. Um, um, you know, I think uh, I, I'm so happy also to reconnect. And uh, after reading your book, I can see so many places where we can collaborate and uh, definitely, uh, you know, help each other with fundraising and promote projects. Um, and I am very interested in um, also working in India uh, and other areas where you've been all over the world. Um, uh, well, thanks. And thanks for promoting the book, because it's just my dream to get the book in the hands of girls and also boys to help everyone give a voice to trees, because without trees, we can't stay alive. And so that's the mission of the book. And I'm just really grateful for your sharing it. Thank you so much. Uh, Mike. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you guys. And we'll talk soon, I hope. Yeah. So thank you for anybody who's listening. Please make sure to like and subscribe because it really helps spread the word on all of these great guests and their missions like Meg. And we'll see you in the next one. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you everyone for listening.